Great. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am going to hand it over to Austin from our Annapolis loft and Drew uh, from our Vancouver loft, and they are going to talk to you about downwind sales. Hi, guys. Thank you for joining us here on this uh, Sunday evening um, here in Annapolis. It is uh, 730. So thank you for checking in with us uh, at this time of the night. And then Drew, you're out in British Columbia, right? In, in Canada? Um, I'm in Vancouver, up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so today uh, we're gonna be chatting about uh, downwind cruising sales. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna chat about tonight. Um, part one, uh, it's gonna be, gonna be setting up your cruiser for a downwind spinnaker. So we're gonna go over what parts are needed um, as well as optional handling systems. Uh, on the second part, we're gonna go through trimming, jiving uh, your cruising spinnaker. Uh, we're gonna go through how to trim a cruising spinnaker, difference between inside and outside jibes, um, as well as how to get yourself out of trouble. Um, yeah, so I'll continue on. So go, we'll go ahead and get, yeah, we'll go ahead and get right into part one here. What hardware is needed? Uh, and for, Drew, you want to go ahead on what hardware we need to go ahead and rig up these types of downwind sails? I know we get a lot of questions in our loft, like, hey, I want to buy this spinnaker. And, I, you know, a lot of people, I think, go ahead and buy the spinnaker, but they don't realize quite what all hardware is involved. Um, so you want to go through the different pieces of what you actually need to make it all work, uh, you know, work as a, as a system. 100%. So I think the first thing is a spinnaker halyard. So I've, I've I'll run into a couple characters that have thought that they could use their Genoa halyard, uh, which is usually um, below the forestay out of the sheave. Um, you really want to have a separate spinnaker halyard. Um, and, and the reason for that is you want that spinnaker halyard to be above uh, your forestay or where your forestay connects to the mast. Um, so that when you jibe, it can rotate on the outside of your forestay. Um, just touching on the spinnaker halyard itself, um, you probably in terms of like size, everyone wants to know how or how long you want your spinnaker halyard. And usually you want to do mast height times two um, if you're locking it off on the mast. If you're running it back to the cockpit, you probably want to add another four or five meters so you can get it into the cockpit and maybe even around a winch. Um, Preferably, you can just tie, you know, the old bowline on there, uh, but to make things a little bit easier, you probably want like a trigger shackle. Um, and then the diameter of the line is probably, well, most of the time it's boat size. So, you know, the larger the boat, usually the larger the, the, the spinnaker halyard is going to need due to loads. Um, and then also your sheave size. So you don't want to get a halyard that's going to be too large to fit inside your sheave. Um, do you mind popping back to that uh, hardware needed? Um, yeah. There. Hold on. Yep. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, so we can go in the, now that, so we went over this finger halyard. You're going to want to get a tack line. Um, so the tack line is a line that run off the bow um, and up into the tack of your sail. Um, you can make it uh, adjustable by um, basically running it through a block. So you can see um, on the left hand side, it's a little bit of a, yeah, right down in there exactly. And you just attach a block. You can attach it anywhere up there on the bow, usually forward of your forestay. Um, and then you just run your tack line through that. You can run your tack line. You can just run it back to the cockpit. Um, that's always preferable. And then maybe even through a clutch uh, close to a winch, just in case you want to make any adjustments. Uh, but if you want to keep it super simple, you could just put around a cleat if you have a cleat up on your bow. Okay. Um, spinnaker sheets and blocks. Um, so you're going to want a set of spinnaker sheets. Um, the spinnaker sheets, you're going to want probably twice the length of your boat uh, plus another 10 feet. Um, so that's a good picture there. Um, the sheeting block locations are gonna be near the aft of your uh, boat. A lot of the time there's like little D-rings off, off the stern um, and you can just attach it there. What I like to do is sometimes I like to have a little becket on the block and then I bungee it up uh, to a lifeline or uh, higher onto the stanchion. Um, 
and that just keeps them from kind of falling around um, when you're when they're not in use or not under load. Um, hey, Drew, go, Drew, going back to the tack lines for a second, a lot of people ask, do I need a one to one or a two to one tack line? Is there a preferred method or is there different um, circumstances that would require you to use a two to one versus just having a one to one tack line? Or, you know, I have some people that don't even who, who don't use a tack line, but are they kind of missing out on some performance gains that they could have by, you know, utilizing an adjustable tack line? Yeah, hundred percent. So like, I think the, the one-to-one -one tack line is usually good for like the snuffer system. Um, pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But once you start getting into a furling system, um, going to a two-to-one tack line is preferable. Uh, first reason for you can, you can get more load on the tack line itself, uh, two-to-one. Um, and second of all, usually if you ever have, if you have a downwind sail, that's a continuous, um, like a, like a bottom up furler, you're definitely going to want to have a two-to-one uh, tack line and that just helps prevent the drum from spinning um okay. so those are those are probably two of the yeah and do you and with the uh with the adjustable tack line setup what other performances you know performance do you gain with the sail are you able to sail different angles um can you change the shape of the spinnaker you know kind of what are people looking for when they're going out to set their tack line for for going sailing yeah, so, you know, I usually like to have, uh, like on the left-hand picture, the one-to-one, -one, I usually like to have the spinnaker uh, kind of set up to sit right above the pulpit, maybe slightly higher. Mm -hmm. um, so right in, right in this spot right in here? Yeah, so it's somewhere right in there, right in that wheelhouse. And then um, if you want to, and you're trying to sail a little bit further downwind, um, you can kind of ease that tack line. And what that does is it lengthens the luff of your sail. Um, and basically it allows the sail to rotate in front of the boat and it will allow you to sail a little bit uh, deeper. And then mm -hmm. kind of the opposite, you can tighten your tack line down a little bit, which will straighten your luff and allow you to sail higher angles. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point because, you know, most of the time when people are buying these sails, they're using them for a variety of wind speeds and wind angles. And, um, you know, everyone knows to adjust your sheet, you know, when you trim a sail, but, you know, with these downwind sails, not a lot of people know that you can adjust the, you know, the tack line, just like you would adjust, say, a halyard on a jib to change the shape as well. It works in somewhat of a similar type fashion. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So we went through spinnaker sheets and blocks. Um, in terms of, you know, we get asked what kind of size people need on their spinnaker sheets. And most of the time, yet again, it's sized for, you know, what the boat is going to see. If you're a blue water cruiser, you might upsize that sheet, you know, one or two times what the, you know, what the sheet says just to be on the safe side. And most of the time, you know, the working loads on these sails isn't going to ever get close to what the block is seeing, but it's, um, it's that shock load that you might occasionally introduce, you know, when that sail luffs because you're not paying attention to it. And, and that's where you want that extra safety factor in there if you're going to be using these um, kind of offshore blue water cruising and that sort of thing. Um, so our next piece of hardware that we get asked about a lot, and I think um, modern boats have really, you know, taken care of this for us. They all, most modern um, kind of cruising boats that have come out in the last five, six years all have some sort of Jenniker or Code Zero attachment. Do you have to have like a bow sprit, um, Drew, to, to have a, an asymmetrical spinnaker? Or are there some other ways that you can make these sails effective on, say, older style bow pulpits that we see? Um, yeah, like what, what we were kind of chatting about there earlier, um, you can definitely just set up a block. So you don't need a bow sprit. They, you know, um, they are nice. They do get the sails separated from the boat, uh, a little bit better performance, a little bit easier jiving. But saying that, as you can see in the previous picture, where you just kind of set a block up off the bow, that works just as much in, you know, in terms yeah. of um cost it really keeps the cost down it's you know you're looking at a tack line and and a block with a becket on it and maybe mm -hmm. um piece of bungee um yeah and it seems to work pretty well um a lot of people have set it up that way and then maybe sometime down the road look at adding a bow sprit um mm -hmm. if you're just looking to try it I'd, I'd probably suggest doing that and then you know maybe look on the market for for a bow sprit yeah, so here is just a, you know, classic example of a, of a J105. And when Drew says bow sprit, um, just for anyone who doesn't happen to know, that's the black pole extending off of the bow here. And you can see that gets the sail 
um, further out in front of the boat so you can do things like inside jibes. Um, the performance is, uh, you, you gain a bit of performance because you're able to take the sail lower and make a better VMG when you're going downwind. Um, going on to the next slide, we just have that same photo that uh, Drew was talking about earlier about flying it off the bow. So this guy just like, you know, like Drew was saying, he's trying it out. He puts about a block right there on the bow and uh, he gives it a rip. And then what we've seen a lot of people do recently too is the anchor roller, right, Drew? Yeah. You, you had guys using those? Yeah, no, totally. And like, you know what I've actually seen and, and some people are, are actually just doing those low friction rings. So it actually just basically spectra lash a low friction ring onto their, mm -hmm. you know, their bow anchor roller and just run it through that. Um, I saw, actually saw that on the on a boat on Friday. I meant, meant to grab a picture and put it on this, but I, I forgot. Um, but you can also see in this picture here, um, you can see the, the white tie, so it's a sail tie. So if you have that open concept um, pulpit, um, just for, I don't know, safety precautions and so that, that sail can't get inside your pulpit and, and you know maybe grab it and take it for a whirl. Um, <laughs> you, you just basically take a sail tie and you attach it to the two top pieces of your pulpit and that will prevent that tack line from, from going through and, and grabbing that pulpit, especially if it's under load or-, or if Yeah. Yeah, that's a good tip. I've even seen um, another thing you want to look out for if you do use your anchor roller is a lot of boats keep their running lights you like on a bow pulpit stanchion up there kind of strapped on. And I've seen some get ripped off when you jibe. So it's another another piece of hardware up there that you want to make sure you take a good look around at what is up there if you decide to use the anchor roller. And kind of think about the, you know, how the sail is going to be moving when you jibe and what the repercussions might be. Um, with a tack line kind of rolling through your bowsprit, uh, taking stuff for a whirl and a lot of wind. So at North, um, in terms of classifying cruising spinnakers, we use three different types, a G0, a G1, and a G2. Um, and I think probably the easiest way to start out is with the G1, which is this green blob right here in the middle. And that's kind of your jack of all trades sail. You know, it's a, it's a sail that you can reach with. It's a sail that you can run with. It's going to have a little bit narrower shoulders than say a G2, which is a true running spinnaker. Um, and so for most people, uh, as a sailmaker, I would recommend the G1 if you're just going to get one sail. A G1 is going to do most of what you're going to throw at it without, you know, any issues whatsoever. If you want to get a little bit on the you know the fancier side or you, the budget allows it you could get two sales and then I would recommend the G0 and the G2 because the G0 is going to cover you know real tight light air reaching down to say like 90 apparent um, in the bigger breezes and then it crosses over into the G2 which is a big full shouldered uh, running spinnaker that's going to use to get you VMG or velocity made good straight downwind. Do you have but, anything you want to add there, Drew? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add, like, I, I saw a lot of the, the G1s, and and I think the biggest thing with the G1, if you want to be able to reach and run with it and make it a little versatile, is getting that adjustable tack line. Like, you yeah. can turn that G1 into a, almost like a code zero pretty quickly by putting that tack line, pulling that tack line down, you know, in, in flat water and lighter airs. You know, I've been up, you know, up around that 45 degrees of parent wind angle. Uh, with the G1, and then you e I've used that tack line bore off, and you know the sails rotating out in front of the front of the boat, and you know it's you can basically sail dead downwind. Um, I always find it's easier to to kind of shape the sail with the tack line, turn a G1 into a G2 or a G1 into a G0, then then kind of yeah. go the opposite way. Yeah, yeah, and I think one other kind of implication that. Um, I try and have customers think about as well as where, you know, where am I going to keep this sail on the boat when I'm cruising? So, you know, having less sails is, means more room for other cruising, cruising items, other fun stuff. So I think if you are looking at building out your downwind inventory, even if you're only looking at getting one sail, you still need to have that thought in the back of your mind about where is this sail going to go when I'm not using it? Like, do you have a sail locker forward? Are you going to keep it um, up in the V berth if you have like a nice um, aft cabin? Are you going to make the kids sleep with it at night? These are all things that you got to kind of take a look at when you do decide to, to build out your downwind inventory. Well, one um, last, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say one last thing is, uh, you know, this code zero, especially on the cruising side of things, I've, I get a lot of calls and people are like, you know, I, I need a code zero. I want a code zero, especially with the, with the newer boats with the, you know, they don't usually use Genoa's anymore. They're usually non-overlapping jibs. One thing you need, I always try to remind people is that the G zero is truly a reaching sail. You know, once you start getting lower than nine degrees of parent wind angle, the sail isn't um, designed to sail those lower angles. So the performance really lacks. Um, so, you know, I think the G1 is, is as we kind of said, if it's just one sale, the G1 kind of kind of hits all the all the spots. All the marks, yeah. yeah. So then going forward, um, the, you know, the question we always hear, or the statement that I hear a lot from customers is, I you know, I want to use a spinnaker, but I'm not confident in getting the thing up, taking the thing down, whether you're shorthanded or, you know, sailing as a couple or as a, as a family, a spinnaker can be a very daunting thing to, to put up in the air and then, more, you know, even harder, get it down. So what kind of sail handling systems can we look at, Drew, to make these sails easier to, uh, easier to get up and down and, and back to the dock safely? So there, there's two different types of uh, sail handling systems. And one is your traditional snuffer, um, been around for ages, tied, tested, and true. Um, then you have, uh, in the last, I would say, 10 years, they've kind of uh, come out with, uh, with furling systems for free flying sails. So uh, a top down or continuous furler. Um, so when you say a, a free flying sail, Drew, what do you mean by that? You know, we hear the term top down and bottom up furler. Could you kind of explain the difference between that and say like a jib furler for us real quick? Yeah, so the free flying sail is just the sail is separated from the boat, so it's not actually attached like uh, onto a foresail or a mast. Um, the top down furlers will have an external uh, torsion line. You can yeah, see you can kind of see it in that photo right there that it's a totally separate cable that the sail furls around. Yeah, exactly. And then if you were to go with the G zero option, you would probably have that uh, torsion line inside the sail. Um, and, and that, that's just because it has a straighter luff. Um, the, the top down furler for the, for the G1 and the G2, um, usually you have a bit of a longer luff, uh, than the point to point measurement, um, from the top of your drum, top of your swivel to the bottom of the drum. Um, so it kind of allows you to have a little bit more sail shape. Gotcha. Yeah. I think that's a really important distinction there, Drew, because some people don't quite, uh, or they get a little bit confused that the cable is external to the spinnaker um, with a, you know, say a top down furling G1 or G2. And I think it's hard to wrap your head around at first. We actually have a video here that we're going to hopefully show you and make it make a little bit more sense um, for those of you who aren't or who are new to top down furling that will kind of explain the whole concept as we get forward. But first, as Drew hit on, we want to talk about the tried and true, the classic snuffer. Um, can you explain what it is, Drew, and kind of how it works? Yeah, so I'm just going to read, read the definition. And the snuffer is a sock that is pulled over the spinnaker to snuff the air out of it. Um, once in the sock, the spinnaker can be lowered to the deck. Um, one thing that, you know, uh, Austin brought up uh, when we were putting this presentation together is, you know, there, there are older versions of, there's a few different versions of snuffers. But what you really want to look at when you get one is make sure that there's an external pocket for that continuous line to run through. Um, you don't want that continuous line inside the snuffer. Um, it just ends up causing a little bit, you know, problems and problems on water are never good. And you know, I find uh, that this continuous line just runs much more freely when it's in its own pocket. Do you yeah, on, the, on this particular model, it runs right down this blue um, panel right here. And at the top, there's a, a block that allows the, the two to one to run inside of there. Um, and it, it's become standard on most stocks, but we still see the occasional sock that doesn't have it. And that's usually when people are getting into trouble with these types of snuffers. Uh, so you want to talk about putting your sail in the snuffer real quick, just to show people kind of the, the attachments and how easy it is. Yeah, no, this, it's super simple. So you can see um, on step one, you kind of lay the spinnaker out on the, on a larger floor. I was going to say loft floor, but everyone doesn't own a sail loft. Um, so you lay it out on the floor or maybe a field. It's a nice day. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to take your snuffer out, step two, um, take it out of the packaging or whatever it's in. You want to lay that out. And then what you want to do is you want to 
on step three, you can see that they've, they've technically they've, they've pulled the continuous line so the snuffers bunched up. So this would be the same as if the snuffers at the very top of the sail um, when the sail was flying. And you can see attachment. So that attachment there attaches to the head of the sail. You can see that in step four. Um, that piece is usually attached to a piece of webbing and that webbing runs through the top of the snuffer. Um, and usually there's a ring that you would attach your halyard to. Once you have the sail attached to the top piece, what you wanna do is you can, you can pull the continuous line or sometimes I just grab that bucket piece and I pull it down the sail. Um, you know, and then, then you basically snake it into your bag, step six. One thing is if you do have a, if you have a spinnaker and you're wondering what size of snuffer should I get? Um, sometimes I find people think that they should be the length of the luff of the sail, um, but you'll save yourself a couple dollars and probably a little bit of issues. If you get it, you want it, pro the proper is the leech length of the sail. And the reason for that is usually the corners are a little stiff, like your clue and your tack, and you don't want to snuff your clue into the snuffer because sometimes it can get jammed in there and not come back out. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point because a lot of people um, will say, hey, I got this spinnaker that came with my boat, but the snuffer doesn't come all the way down to the bottom. And that's just a common kind of clear up that we give people like, no, that's what you want. You want to have, you know, the bottom or the foot kind of hanging out a little bit to make sure that, it'll, that it, will, it will unsnuff again for you. Yeah, and like 90 not 95 percent of the sail is are in that sock so you know you've got a little bit of sail material to work with at the bottom but it's usually pretty manageable uh in any sort of sea state yeah. or, or wind strength and one other kind of uh, pro tip i guess we can give you as well is when you do if you ever for you need to take the sail in and out of the snuffer for whatever reason if you take a sail tie and you tie it from the head attachment for the sail to the top of the snuffer you never have to worry about doing the continuous line, bunching it up again. The sail tie just holds that out for you all the time. So that whenever you do want to put the sail back into the snuffer, it's a quick and easy transition to just plug it in. There's a couple boats that I sail and race on that use their spinnakers racing, and then they put a snuffer on it to go cruising. And so they're swapping back and forth a fair bit, even on the boat. And they'll sometimes do that. They'll just have the sail tie there, hook the sail up, and then hoist it with the snuffer already at the top, and then snuff it after they're done sailing, and, and they're right back into the snuffer ready to go for, for short-handed cruising. Um, give me one second. Do you want me Clear. to chat about kind of how to, the kind of the steps and processes of, of how to use the snuffer? Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Perfect. Um, so first, you want, to, you want to get that snuffer in the air. So basically to hoist, or you, you want to put your sail up, so you hoist your snuffer to the top of the uh, top of the mast, um, and then once it's to the top of the mast, you want to make. I, I always make sure the tack line and the sheets are attached. Um, you don't want to be pulling that snuffer up if all three corners are not attached. Um, so once it's up, you pull that continuous furling line to lift the bucket up to the head of the sail. You can see on the right side they're probably. Well, actually, I'm not sure if they're going up or down. I think it might be coming down. Um, but that's probably about. 60% of the way up. So you just pull and that bucket just goes all the way to the top and then you just want to pull your sheet and start trimming your sail. Uh, to douse, you want to pull the continuous line, obviously the opposite direction of uh, the way you previously did it to get it up. And that will take that bucket and it will drop down on the spinnaker um, and snuff the air out of it. Um, once that's done, um, usually you want to put the sail away. So what I usually do is I uh, have the bag on deck and I usually have the bag I like to have the bag either tied or clipped on to the lifelines um, they don't they don't tend to swim very well or for too long um, and what I usually find works is that I kind of snake the sail into the bag and it just seems to fit a little nicer than than dropping it all in almost um, like say a traditional spinnaker without the snuffer since it is in this nice kind of tube uh, sock it can, you can kind of snake it in and it actually comes out a little bit nicer as well um, do you have any comments on that austin no i think that that works well i would say the only thing i would add is right before you drop or put the sail into the bag i like to attach the tack and the clue to the the sides of the bag with the little velcro tabs just like you would you know like a traditional spinnaker so they're ready to go before you rehoist and then like drew said just snake it snake it right into the bag after that and that just keeps the three corners you know, from getting into mischief while it's in the bag and you're not using it. 
Another thing to think about uh, before we jump into this video is maybe uh, attaching that continuous line to something on the deck. I've had a few times mm -hmm. with customers and it's been a little windy um, or we've had to douse the kite to get around a corner or something. And uh, if the continuous line isn't attached, sometimes you can just get off to the side of the boat and you usually have to bear off to try to, you know, maybe blanket uh, that snuffer with your mainsail and that, that line will come back in. But if you have it attached, uh, you know, you, you don't need to have it tight or anything. You just need to make sure that it's attached to something so that when you want to go get it, it's available to you. Do you have like a preferred location on the boat that you like to tie it, Drew? Like I, I steer people towards either the mast or sometimes there's a cleat on the foredeck they can they can lock it off to so that it's right there for the yeah. for the douse. Hundred percent. Usually, there's some. Sometimes there's like little D rings up near the bow or something somewhere like in the middle of the bow. I kind of find works. Uh, yeah, like in here. Yeah, exactly. Right, right in that that spot. Yeah. There. yeah. So we'll have a quick, quick little video um, that we found. I think this is a bit of a throwback from the North uh, Archives, but it still gets the job done and kind of shows you a snuffer in action. Here's deploying. So you can see it goes right up there. Um, works like that every time, 100% of the time <laughs> and uh, no mischief ever, obviously in this video. And then when you go for the snuff, right there on the foredeck, the crew member just pulls straight down and the kite goes away. I think you always wanna turn down and I believe you can kind of tell in this video that this, this skipper has turned his boat uh, further away from the wind, which like Drew said, gets that kite behind the mainsail to, uh, to blanket it. And the final kind of uh, safety, safety button that I, you can do if you have say like a trigger shackle on your tack is you can, um, if you have a spike to use with a tie Alaska, you can spike the tack and the sail will fly completely behind the main and then you can snuff it. I've only had to do that a couple of times on say like a real tight reach if we were racing. Um, but that's another kind of way to get the sail behind the main so that it takes all the air out of it and you can snuff it easy after that or relatively easy after that. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add there, Drew? Yeah, just remember to ease the sheet, you know, snuffing, you know, you'll probably be able to get snuff the sail um, in light to medium breeze without easing that sheet, but it just makes life a lot easier on yourself or the the person doing the snuffing. If you just ease that sheet so the sail doesn't have any load in it. Uh, but I really like that comment about having that trigger on that tack line, like having, setting up your halyards and your tack line, your sheets, so you can take them on or put them on and take them off easily. Uh, but also if you do run into a bit of trouble, you can just uh, spike that uh, trigger tackle or, or pull it. Uh, and then, yeah, the tack line releases and the sail swings back and there's basically no load in it at all. But the sail is still connected to the snuffer as well as the sheets to uh, your boat. So it's, it's, it's fine. It's yeah, it's just gonna fine. essentially, when you snuff, it'll just be kind of st stuck to the back of your mainsail. And then you can either pull it in to the companion way if it's kind of a hairy situation or, you know, walk it back forward and put it on the deck. But it's another good way to, to take the air out of it. And then going towards furlers, um, oops, sorry about that. Next slide. So top-down furlers, like Drew was mentioning earlier, are the type of furlers where the cable is separate from the sail. And they're called top-down furlers because the cable, when you go to furl, you spin the cable and eventually the torsion, if you think of it like a, a cable spinning, it catches at the top and it starts wrapping the spinnaker up from the top all the way down to the bottom. Um, and what a lot of people, I guess, are a little bit concerned about the first time they furl a top-down furler is they'll, you know, you furl for the first like five or six turns and nothing's really happening. But what's happening is the torsion is transferring from the bottom up to the top of the cable. And eventually, if you keep going, the sail catches and it starts furling up really, really nicely if it's all done correctly. So it's one of those systems where and it works really well if you have a good system and you you practice with it, you know, in lighter air first and then you take it up, you know, into bigger breeze and you use the same system every time. It's a it's a great way of, of handling your spinnaker, but it's also it can run into issues as well. We, we definitely see that you can 
uh, make a couple mistakes that lead to having to drop the sail and kind of rework the cable. So furlers are awesome, but I think it's really important if you do get a furler to talk to your sailmaker about how to use it correctly, or even get him to come out and show you how to use it because it'll save you a lot of headache um, in the long run when you're using these types of systems. When you get a top-down furler, you gotta have the furler itself, the continuous furling line, the torsion cable, which is what captures the sail, the thimbles, which essentially just terminate the ends of the cable, um, and, and then a two to one shackle on the bottom of the furler, which you can see here. So those, a lot of places are selling them as a kit now. You can find them online, you can buy them from sail makers, but I think that's kind of the comprehensive list of the stuff that you would need to get started with top-down furling. And I have a video here that will hopefully better explain than me on how this works visually. So if you look there, the first, you know, five or six turns, nothing's really happening here. And the tack is actually spinning, you know, the tack isn't moving at all, which is very different than say your jib furler where the whole thing furls up, you know, together parallel with the, the furling mandrel itself. So the torsion's building up there and eventually it catches and it's still spinning freely down here. And you can see in this next shot, hold on, there when it unfurls, how the bottom comes out way before the top. So you can tell when you, re, when you furl it the first time, the first you know, 15 turns are all at the top. And then eventually the whole thing furls up more similar to like what your Genoa would once it gets going. Um, Drew, you wanna go into kind of the, how to hoist and unfurl just like you did with the snuffer? Yeah, so obviously, you know, it's step one, attach your tack line sheets and halyard uh, to the sail. Um, then you're gonna wanna sneak your tack line out. Um, then now you're just gonna raise your halyard and to proper tension. So tension is pretty important to get these torsion lines to work correctly. Um, you know, you're gonna want a low stretch halyard. If you're, you're definitely gonna wanna upgrade to a low stretch halyard if you are going with the further option, probably not as mm -hmm. important as yeah. snuffer, but for uh, the torsion line, you're gonna want a low stretch halyard. Um, a lot of the time I will mark where, um, say if I get the torsion line up or the sail up on the torsion line, um, I will mark the halyard somewhere near the clutch uh, to kind of give me an idea of, of how much tension I need. So I'm not kind of guessing every time. So usually the first time out there, I'll get the proper tension and I'll furl it, I'll unfurl it a couple of times and then I'll mark the halyard. And sometimes I even mark the tack line. So you just have repeatable settings. Yeah. To take the thinking out of it. Yeah, um, when, and another thing to mention with, if you're gonna use a two to one tack, you're gonna have the tack line pretty slack and you're gonna bang the halyard to the top and you're gonna you know lock that off. And then you're gonna do all of your adjustment from the bottom with the two to one, um, the two to one tack line. So I think Drew's point of, of having the marks is like knowing once you hit the top with your halyard, you put a mark there and then cranking your tack line down to a, to a certain mark is absolutely the way, the way to do it. Yeah, you would rather, you would rather probably a little bit of room on near the tack instead of the head, uh, just with that, that halyard, um, you know, there, it can kind of twist a little bit and spin. Uh, so the more halyard inside the mast, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then tension spinnaker sheet and use continuous line to, uh, to unfurl it. So um, some people think they just need to pull on the spinnaker sheet and it should run. Sometimes you can do that, uh, but a lot of the time you want to kind of um, jumpstart it by using that continuous line, um, obviously opposite of how you furled it up to, to unroll the sail and get yeah. that get that torsion line spinning off the sail. Yeah, and I and one thing that I kind of steer people to do with the back of their furling systems is I like to have a block with a bungee pulling the whole furling line, you know, tight yeah. so that you still can get throw in the system to use it, but that, so that it can't twist in the back. Because if you get a twist in the line on an unfurl or during a furl, it, it can get hairy. So that's that's the best way of setting your furling line up is having a block at the end of the continuous line for the continuous furling line, and then a bungee pulling it back with a fair bit of length to it to make sure that it's gonna keep it tight. And I, I've actually seen on, on some of the bigger boats, um, 
say 40 plus, some people will run uh, that um, continuous line all the way back to the cockpit. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have, you can actually, um, if you find the, just the continuous line and furling it up being a little, you know, a little difficult, um, you can put it around a drum and actually, um, or, and, and furl it in, uh, and, or sorry, grind it in. Uh, if you have an electric winch, um, those tend to work. Um, but you know, <laughs> yeah. you don't, if you don't have an electric one, uh, just throw a winch handle in there and, uh, you know, you might, might not uh, be, have as many sweat beads on your forehead after you get the, get the sail all wrapped up. Yeah. And it, I would say that, you know, I see a lot of people do it with the electric winch and it works excellent. Just remember the electric winch is going to keep pulling even when the sail doesn't want you to anymore. So always be looking at the sail when you're, uh, when you're winding that, that thing up. Um, do you want to talk about dousing as well? Some, uh, some tips and tricks for that, Drew? Yeah, hundred percent. So as, as we talked about, you know, how your tension is important. Okay. And then another thing you want to do uh, is make sure that your back stay is tension. So a lot of the time you're going down when you've eased your back stay. If you do have an adjustable back stay, especially for the racers out there, that's pretty traditional. Um, but with, um, with a furling system, you're going to be putting a lot of load on that torsion line. Um, so if you don't have any back stay on, you can kind of invert your mast. Um, so you kind of want to you know, you, I'd say match the load on the back. So, you know, you don't have to crank it on. If, if you have a, you know, if you're running a code zero, you're probably going to be having that load a little bit tighter. Um, so probably a little bit more for a code zero uh, than, than like a um, top down external. Um, so what you want to do first always, and it's, it's very easy to forget is to bear away and take pressure off the kite. Okay. So you want to give yourself enough room or runway uh, so that you're not trying to do this all in a very, a very quick, so you can bear off and you have room to bear off. Um, you start pulling the continuous furling line, uh, basically until the sail furls up. But one thing that you need to remember is um, the first five to 10 turns, you're building uh, basically torsion, that torsion line. Uh, so the sail won't actually start furling and, and you got to keep going. Um, I find I've been out with a couple people and they've done it, say two or three, and then they stop um, and just take a look. I always, I usually am furling it. Um, and then I usually let someone tell me, say, okay, it started. Um, and then you can kind of maybe slow down a little bit or take your time. But those first five to 10, don't expect the sail just to wrap up like a, um, like a head sail. Um, mm -hmm. It does take a little bit, little bit more work. Um, so again, once the, once the sails furled, I always recommend to drop it. Um, these systems, they, they can tend to unfurl uh, without notice. Um, so, you know, you don't want to be, you know, leaving it up and say sailing up wind. Uh, something you can do is you can have a Velcro patch put onto the clue of the sail and that kind of helps keep the sail contained because you can't always get it down right away. But I would say the first opportunity you want to get that sail down. Also, as we all know, sails break down from UV um, and nylon, usually what spinnakers are made of, um, doesn't like sun. So if you leave it furled up and up in the air for say, you know, a, a couple of weeks, it's going to get a lot of UV exposure on the areas that are shown. Um, and that's just going to basically lead to you needing to replace the sail um, sooner than later. Um, then the last thing, again, you want to detach your halyard, your tack line and your sheets. That's if you're putting it away. Um, you know, if you're just furling it up and putting it down to say, get into, um, get around an island or something, you can leave all that stuff attached and then just have it ready to go again uh, once you start bearing off and heading back downwind. Do you yeah, I'd say one, one massive pro of the, the top down furler is the spinnaker gets really small in the bag. So the bag ends up taking up a lot less room than say like a spinnaker in a snuffer or a spinnaker just in a regular bag is that cable really does wind the sail on very tight and it ends up you know it's like where'd all the sail go it's just like a small little snake in the bottom of the bag so that's one one big benefit when it does go does go well it's, it's really nice for storage purposes yeah and it does add a little bit of weight so like make sure you're uh make sure you're lifting with your knees um especially for the bigger boats you know the the torsion line, the unit, um, if you have your sheets in there, um, you know, it, it does add a bit of weight and it's, it's, you know, it's not as light as your 0.75 ounce spinnaker when it's by yourself, by itself in that bag. Yeah. 
Um, just want to check in with everyone real quick. I see we got a few messages coming in to the group chat. And I just want to let you know, we're going to answer all of those at the very end. We have probably five or six more slides to get to, and then we'll open it up for questions and uh, we'll try and answer, you know, as many as we can in a, in a timely fashion. Uh, just a couple uh, tips and tricks for everyone, Drew, on tr uh, trimming their cruising spinnaker, right? It's a set it, forget it, kick your feet back and uh, and sail towards the, towards the sunset, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, yeah. So like just for... For trimming, trimming asymmetrical is much easier than your traditional symmetrical spinnaker. You don't, you know, you don't have a pole or an adjustable pole. You don't have a downhaul. So, so basically, and you don't have a sheet and a guy. Um, so basically you have a sheet and a lazy sheet. So you just have the sails loaded off one sheet on the leeward side of the boat. Um, basically you ease that sheet until that loft breaks or curls. Um, soon as that loft starts breaking or curling, you wanna pull in that sheet until the luff stops um, breaking or curling. So pretty simple. So just, just basically ease until you see that front edge break. As soon as that front edge breaks, you can pull it in a little bit. And um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to chase down that, uh, that guy on the sunset, you know, you're gonna to wanna to be constantly <laughs> that, uh, that kite. But a lot of the time you're out there just kind of enjoying yourself. Um, and what I always recommend is kind of do a bit of an auto trim. So when you when you set your kite, say if you have a perfect trim and you start driving up or down five degrees, if you drive up, it's okay. But as soon as you start, oh sorry, if you drive down, it's usually okay. You're, you're slightly over trim. But if you start heading up, that front edge of the sails gonna break. So if you want ability to you know head up and, and bear off and not be you know pointing pointing in a straight line, uh, which is almost impossible on a sailboat. I have this auto trim thing, and what I do is I over, I, I ease the sheet, let the sail break, then I pull it back in so it's perfectly trimmed, and then I over sheet uh, the sail by about three to five feet. And you can kind of see it in this picture. This guy's obviously um, knows this tactic because uh, you can tell that sail is a little bit over trimmed. Uh, but at the same time, you know you don't need a perfect trim sail all the time, and allows him to you know have a little bit of maneuverability um, in his driving. Um, mm -hmm. And then if another you're setting thing, up, as we, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was don't just going to say, if you're setting up for autopilot and you do have the ability to set it for like wind, true wind angle is a good um, system set up too. If you set it to a parent, your parents moving around so much with the boat accelerating and different puffs hitting it, it makes it tough to drive. But if you dr set it to true wind angle, it makes the autopilot seem to behave a bit better. I do a fair bit of double handed sailing. And whenever we are doing a maneuver, or we have the auto helm steering, we, we steer by true wind angle downwind for the auto helm. No, that's a very good point. Um, and then the last thing, we kind of touched about this earlier, but like I'm a big fan of this is, is easing and tightening the tack line. So you can, you can pull on your tack line. And actually, you know, some of the furling systems do have adjustable uh, tack lines. Uh, so you can, you can, Tighten your tack line, which straightens a lot for the sail, and that allows you to sail higher angles. Um, and then you can ease your tack line, and uh, basically the sails, the luff technically gets longer, uh, the sail gets a little bit more shape, and it allows the sail to rotate in front of the boat, and that, that's better for downwind angles. Uh, you know, you'll be able to sail a little bit further downwind. Um, kind of experiment, you know. The one thing you have to think about is the more you ease your tack line, uh, the more, you know, uh, movement there's going to be with the kite so if you're in like you know a fairly big sea state you might not want to be easing your tack line five or six feet to try to get right downwind um, mm -hmm. just because the kite's going to have a lot of motion in it um, but you know if you're in a if you're in a flat sea state and you know light to medium air like experiment a little bit ease that tack line and see how much that sail can rotate in front of your boat and bear off and and kind of you know mm -hmm. maybe push the limits a little bit and just just see what the adjustments in the tack line does for you and your boat. Yeah, and if you're driving and you do have the tack line eased, your goal is to keep the tack line vertical. So you want to kind of drive the boat underneath of the tack line and that's going to be your your optimum kind of sailing angle once you've eased it off is, is you're trying to keep that boat underneath the kite so it's always pulling you correctly down. Um, can we talk a bit about inside jibes versus outside jibes, Drew? I know most of the boats are cruising, you probably recommend outside jibes, but for guys with the bow spritz, we like the, the at least the longer bow spritz, we like the inside jibes. Yeah, no, 100%. And 
Like the inside jibe um, is is a little more tricky than the outside jibe, but at the same time, um, sometimes you can get it done a little quicker. Um, mm -hmm. So the setup, uh, it's all. I always found it very confusing going from a symmetrical sailor to an asymmetrical uh, sailor. Say in the last fifteen years, was when it's on the deck and you're setting up your sheets and your tack line, how to run the tack line so that it's set up for an inside or set up for an outside. I'll tell you when I first started, how many times uh, I was trying to set up for an inside jive and the kite got up in the air and the, it was set up for an outside jive. And the little trick that I learned uh, from a good friend of mine was just get the tack line to go underneath the, sp the spinnaker sheets. And then that will allow the sail. Um, so that when the sail goes up, the, the sheet is going to be between the forestay and uh, the sail. Um, when jibing the sail, you, you know, the, the, um, the sheet is going to rub on the forestay. Um, sometimes I have seen a little bit of wear and tear from that. Um, so sometimes you might want to be a little bit careful, but um, at the same time, you know, every season, if you're taking your boat out or you're doing your check over, you might want to take a look at your foil and just see if there has been any damage on there. Um, and then in light air, uh, you know, inside jives are, as Austin brought up, are, are best yeah. used in light air with a pull. And we've got a little video here, uh, another J105 seem to be popular today. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can see the clue goes inside right there. So that, that's what makes it the inside jive. I can show it one more time for everyone. Yeah, and th this is a, you know, this looks like a racing team out there uh, practicing. So, you know, you're probably not gonna have five or six people on the boat. Um, one thing though, that does help on an inside job is if you saw that lady, I think, you, yeah, could you rewind it a little bit there? You can see once that clue gets to that four stay, she helps that sail around and she pulls it and pulls down. And that kind of helps the sail just kind of twist and, and, you know, pop open on the new side. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you have a full crew and you're, you know, if you're racing, most people are doing inside jibes unless they just have no bow sprit at all. But I think for the shorthanded teams out there or the boats without the bow sprits, we'd like to do an outside jibe, right? Drew, a little bit safer, a little slower, but you know, you, you less chance of wrapping the head stay probably, would you say? hundred percent. I, uh, yeah. I, I sailed on a few boats doing some offshore racing and we, since we were offshore, the, the owner only allowed outside jibes just due to just less errors, less chance of something happening. Yeah. And so I think I'll just switch right over to the video. Um, so you can kind of talk them through the differences with the outside jibe yeah. that we have here. Back to our favorite snuffer video. But, um, yeah. oh, let me go back for a second. I think you wanted to talk about that little batten on the front of the sail. Right oh, the, yeah, the jobulator. Right here. Yeah. yeah, so that, that jobulator there. So you actually, so on the, with the outside jibe, the, the lazy sheet is gonna be running from your, your clue around the front of the sail on the outside. And we've, we've made this little it's a piece of plastic with some material over it basically. And, and you put the lazy sheet on top of that. And, and what that prevents is this, the sheet's ability to slip underneath the boat. So that lazy sheet, you know, you're, you're trimming with your other one, that other sheet, sometimes if you're not paying attention, you usually want to keep it somewhat snug, but you know, that's not always the case when you're out there. And that jibulator prevents that uh, sheet from falling underneath the boat and you having to retrieve it. Yeah. And some boats, if they don't have that on their sail, they can tape, you know, I've seen some boats tape like a little batten on the end of their uh, anchor roller as well as a, uh, I guess a cheap, you know, cheap way of doing it also, yeah. <laughs> if it's not on the sail. I've seen, I've but, seen some people with both. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. double, yeah. Yeah. So th this is, so you can see them setting that up right there, especially before the jibe. Um, and then basically you just blow your sheet um, you can right, see them there. Right, right there. And then you go through the wind and basically the, the sail kind of turns into a flag around the front of the boat and you just pull the sheet in on the other side. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is pretty simple and it's, it's pretty uh, fail proof in terms of uh, getting the kite caught up or, or getting caught in the jive or it wrapping around the fork stay. Um, it's, yeah. pretty, it's a pretty safe maneuver in all conditions. Yeah, and if you're the driver, 
um, you know, doing the turn rate with the person pulling the sail around. So, you know, sticking it a little bit deeper away from the wind until that clue is totally around will help, you know, save your trimmer a little bit of headache getting the, getting the new sheet in. It's as soon as you see that clue clear the force day, then you can kind of finish the turn out and, and come up the course, which I think they do a, a pretty good job of there in that video. Yeah, and just that that's a really good point. And I think making sure that clue is, uh, you know, at that four state. And it, going back to the inside jibes, if you are doing inside jibes, make sure that you're, you're as a driver, you want to basically be focused on that clue. And as soon as that clue gets past your four stay, then you can put the stern through the wind. Because uh, if you don't do that, there is a chance for that sail to go through your four triangle. And you're probably going to need to jibe back. Um, and sometimes wind gets a little swirly when that happens and it ends up wrapping around your four stay. Uh, so just a little bit of preventative me measures there. Yeah, and then our final kind of slide here, getting ourselves out of trouble. I know we've kind of touched on it some, you know, if you, you end up into a brooch, you know, blow the sheet, <laughs> get the boat back on, you know, it's get the boat back on its feet to get moving. Um, if you have like a bad jibe like Drew was just talking about, Probably, I wouldn't say if you hourglass that you necessarily want to return to the previous jibe, but if you just have like a, you know, a bad jibe where the clue doesn't want to come through, but it hasn't wrapped the head stay yet, probably go back to the previous jibe is a good way of doing it, right, Drew? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. Uh, if it, this, this point, this third point was the one I just talked about. So making yeah. sure that clue has cleared the four stay before you jibe, yeah. not just prevents it from going through the forward triangle. Yeah, and then if for whatever reason your furler or your snuffer is not working, so if snuffer, you know, you can still drop the sail old school just right to the deck. And even with the furler, you can do that too. You want to make sure you have the foot of the sail. Um, and you just got to remember that there is going to be a cable coming down quickly with a big heavy top swivel at the top of it coming as well. So if the snuffer or sorry, if the furler is not working correctly, and you're dropping the sail, maybe drop the sail in a very controlled way because there is a lot of hardware coming down and it could be coming very quickly towards you or your, your boat and you wanna make sure you're careful there. Um, so you wanna recap real quick through and then we'll answer some of the questions that we have in the chat. We already got, it looks like four or five really good questions that we can go ahead and get right into after this. Yeah, perfect. So just, you know, we went over three things today and basically we started off with setting up your your sailboat for, for a downwind spinnaker. Um, then we jumped into talking about, you know, the snuffer basically versus the furler and the two different systems and how to use them. Um, and then we finished up, uh, we just touched on, you know, trimming the sail, uh, jibing uh, and jibing the sail. Um, yeah. That, that was it. So first one for Drew, why would you want a trigger shackle for the halyard as opposed to, um, like he understands for say the guy or the sheet or the tack line, but why do you prefer one for the halyard as well? Is it uh, to not catch on anything on the way up or what, what, what's your reasoning there? Yeah, and I find it just easier to, to, to put on and off, just super simple. You know, it's a bit of an investment, especially if you get a nice one, I'd say a couple hundred dollars. Um, but if you get it spliced on, you know, a nice halyard, I just, I just find it works, works better. And you can also, once you take it off, you can snap it onto a lifeline or snap it on. It just makes things happen a little bit quicker, a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, I was going to say the one that I've seen is I've seen it catch like a, like a traditional snap shackle with the ring ding, you know, that you, you open and shut it with. It undone. I've seen, yeah. I've, I've seen them with the ring dings a little bit um, overused catch on something on the way up. And then you, the sail goes to the water, halyards up the mast and you're standing there like, Oh, Got a bit to solve now. <laughs> yeah, no, been there. Um, yeah. One thing I also wanted to touch base on was uh, those trigger shackles. You want to make sure you don't have like a swivel one. So some of them are swivel, and I think they were kind of uh, manufactured in the time where you had symmetrical sails. So you almost want that shackle to be able to swivel. But if you're using a furling device, uh, you don't want that trigger shackle to be uh, able to swivel. It just, just basically when you get the the sail up, the, the trigger shackle, if it has ability to rotate um, and the load kind of comes off the torsion line a bit, it will, it will unspin. Uh, so you'll, you'll just find your, your, your furling will be more successful without a swivel shackle that, that mm -hmm. kind of furls or, or spins, I mean. 
Yeah. So, and then we have another one on thoughts on an AT and tacker, and we have our own version of it. We call it a tech straddle. And I, I can go ahead and hit this one real quick. I think they're they're great if you're going to use the uh, the sail not on a bow sprit, but say inside of your bow pulpit with just a block, you know, right at the deck. And what what an AT and tacker is, or what our tack straddle is, is in layman's terms, it's just a a strap that holds the sail around your furled up Genoa. So that when you do say go reaching with the spinnaker, the tack doesn't then fall off to leeward um, and blow, and you lose the ability to point high with the sail if your tack is falling off to leeward. So there's just this strap out there that pulls that tack back to center line. It kind of swivels around on your Genoa that's furled up, but it doesn't chafe anything, and it it kind of just keeps the tack of the sail to center line where you would want it for optimum sailing. Yeah, okay, it just keeps the sail. I, I find when you put one on, the sail is a little bit more stable. So especially if you're in a big sea state, having one of those kind of keeps uh, the trimming a little bit easier. Yeah, uh, this one's from Bob Drew. Uh, do you need two bales at the masthead for the continuous line snuffer or just one halyard? What, what, what would you think on that one? Well, yeah, I think what he's asking is, do you need a second uh, shiv at the top to hoist the snuffer up and the answer would be no the the block is built into the snuffer um, yeah. so it's just one singular line that hoists the whole unit up and then at the top of the snuffing unit it has all of the block and tackle built into it internally oh exactly yeah um so I, this one's from alex is there a benefit to doing a center launch splice to pigtail versus luggage tagging the pigtail to two eye splices on the end of the spin sheets. And I can, I, 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 hearing it's probably harder to, to answer. So I can hit on this one. Um, the luggage tagging uh, to the pigtail is a nice way of doing it. Like I on J70s, which I sail on a fair bit, that's how we do it. Um, it kind of keeps every uh, knot from being able to catch on anything. However, if you do have the sheets run wrong, it's a project to undo the pig, especially if the sale's up and going, you almost have no way of kind of undoing your mistake. So I would say if you're doing offshore and changing sales a lot, maybe the first way of where you just do the, the pigtail and then you clip onto the pigtail or soft shackle to the pigtail. And then if you're sailing like a, like a performance boat with a launcher using the, the pigtail with two eye splices luggage tagged. Um, this one's from Eric. Uh, is there a way to prevent twists in the snuffers with the sail? Why, and uh, how do you prevent it from happening? Um, the, so sorry, would that be like a twist in? I believe he means a twist like where the sail becomes twisted in the snuffer itself, not the snuffer twisting, I believe. Yeah, like I, I always find it. So when I said, I said like um, to blow the sheet, sometimes you want to ease the sheet uh, when you're snuffing and say if you completely blow it and it ends up out in front of the boat, um, it could kind of spin around on itself a little bit. But if you kind of just keep an eye on it when you're snuffing to make sure that the leech and the luff are in separate areas, um, they it usually, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever snuffed a sail and it be, if, if been, um, when I've unsnuffed it, it been kind of twisted. Um, yeah, I think some of the older snuffers, the heads might be able to twist inside the snuffer and that could be, you know, causing a twist. But I, I know the way ours are now, it's like a webbing strap. And exactly. so the webbing doesn't twist at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you use the snuffer with the head still out? Yeah. So I guess, uh, can you like throw your Genoa out and then snuff the spinnaker? Kind of like if you're doing, you know, like a racing takedown. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Uh, no, it's going to add uh, to the drama. Um, but at the same time, if, if you're comfortable doing that and you want to keep pace, you're, you know, your boat, you know, if you're, if you're, if you have more sales up, your boat's going to be moving quicker. Um, you know, it, it, as I said, it does add a little bit you know, if, depending on how large the head sail is, uh, it's going to be, you know, a little bit difficult maybe to move around up there or maybe get something um, or reach for it. But, uh, you know, it should be done. And, um, you know, if you are in a kind of a racing scenario, uh, it would definitely be the way to go. Yeah, I would say both with a snuffer and with a furling spinnaker, when you go, once you, you, do, you do the deed and you get it snuffed or you get it furled, dropping it to windward 
as opposed to lured is easier. So if you can actually get the, the either the sock or the bundle of furled sail and kind of yank it to the windward side of the head sole, then when you go to drop it, it kind of nicely just falls down the Genoa onto the foredeck right into the bag, as opposed to if you go, you try and go the other way, it can be a bit of a bear. So that's the one, the one thing I'd recommend there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and jibing, is there any issues jibing with the snuffer? No, if, if you really want to be safe, you can snuff, then jive, and then unsnuff. Uh, but with the snuffer, it should be just fine. Um, mm -hmm. That bucket just kind of rotates around the top of the mast up there. Um, so it, it should be fine. Um, like in those videos we saw, they they did complete a jive and they were pretty successful with it. It's it's all the same. It's just there's a there's a bucket at the top of the sail. Um, mm -hmm. You hear it bang around a little bit. Um, but I've, I've never seen, you know, a, a jibe break that bucket or anything so it'd be mm -hmm. it'd be just fine but if you i've a lot of people actually i know especially uh in windy conditions will snuff jibe the boat and then unstuff do you, do you have any comments on that austin no yeah i th i think um in the, like especially in the double-handed racing i've done where we're using snuffers it is on a 43 footer um and the sails are they're pretty big for for two people to handle um so we and so maybe like plus 20 knots, it makes sense for us to, to snuff it and then jibe. And then anything in, under that, we're doing outside jibe. So we'll oversheet the main a bunch so that it's not crashing over. And then uh, we'll just do the outside jibe. But yeah, like you said, you might hear it you know, bang around up there a little bit, but it's made of like a, a Delrin plastic that's not really gonna hurt anything. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Yeah. And then final, we'll do one final question, Bill is having an issue getting it fouled at the mast. Um, and I could, you know, it's probably without seeing it would be tough to answer, but I can see it, you know, the bucket maybe catching, if you have a fractional um, hoisted Genoa, I can see if the spinnaker's masthead and the bucket could be catching on the top swivel of your Genoa some maybe on the way up or the way down. Um, so that could be, you know, one thing that could be happening in terms of solving it. I'm not sure what you know do you have any tips maybe on how to solve that drill if that is what's going I would on just, like i would do it on a light air day i would go out on a light air day and just slowly hoist it up and just keep an eye on the route that that snuffer goes up and just see if it does touch anything or catch anything um and if, if it is if you do find it's hitting something um you know you can you can either kind of get that um continuous line and maybe pull it forward towards the bow a little bit or maybe even even aft depending on what it's catching on um but just kind of looking uh doing everything on it like i always recommend practicing on light air days um and and light you know light wind day and just you know going through all the procedures and then if you do have an issue um you know the wind's not strong so you can kind of sort out that issue without without uh, too much too much happening yeah, and then Alex just said, with a snuffer, do you suggest an outside jibe? And my answer would be, yeah, if the bowsprit's sh short or you're flying it from, say, just kind of a, a bow pulpit, yeah, I would I would stick with the outside jibe. Yeah, I would like I would start with the outside jibes all the time, even if you do have a bowsprit. Um, and then you know, um, once you're comfortable with the whole jibing, especially if you're short-handed. If you want to try an inside jibe, you know, I'd make sure you have your outside jibes, you know, down um, and then kind of try some inside jibes. And inside jibes really get a lot easier when you have more than one or two people on the boat. So you can, you can have someone yeah. help the sail around. Yeah. Well, so thank you, Drew, for joining us. And uh, thank you everyone for, for coming out and attending. It looked like we had a, a lot of people in the audience and and we really appreciate you coming out and listen to, uh, listening to us on a, uh, on a Sunday night when there's football and other things on Drew, football in the U.S., by the way. Not, yeah, I know, uh, I know. I was actually, I was watching the Seahawks game before, uh, before we tuned in here. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. And, and feel free to use us as a resource. Like, um, you know, you can obviously contact your uh, local North Sales expert, uh, but feel free to, you know, uh, send us an email um with any questions uh you may have um i think my email on the right there should be northsales.com uh, just have a little, little typo in that yeah um, but no big deal just drew.mitchell at northsales.com and austin.powers at northsales.com bounce yeah. us an email with any questions you may have and uh we'll get back to you in a timely fashion and th yeah, yeah thank you very much for tuning in and a uh, great job hosting it austin
yeah thanks guys um louisa we'll uh i guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up thanks everyone this will be on youtube that you can watch afterwards uh, it'll be up this week and then of course if you have any questions give these guys a shout thanks guys take care thank you